What's going on guys? Welcome back to your Lake Ford Guide. Hey, this week we're going to be going to the Fun and Sun Tackle Show in Hearst, Texas. We've been there a few times before and man, this is the place to get some of the very best knowledge, very best tips and tricks for bass fishing from some of the best to ever do it. Like I said, we've been there before in the past. This is Turn Back Tuesday, so today what we're going to do is take a look back at some of the best moments, some of my favorite moments that we've experienced right here on your Lake Fort Guide at the Fun and Sun Tackle Show. By the way, guys, before we get into the best moments from the Fun and Sun Tackle Shows of the past, let me tell you about this one. We will be there on this Friday, January 14th. I'll be there starting about midday, be there until closing time on Friday evening. So if you have a chance to come out, please come out on Friday, say hello to me. We'll be doing Hopefully we might be able to get up and do some talks, fishing talks, if we don't get to do it, if I don't get to do it on the stage, there's gonna be a lot of guys like you're about to see right now. I'll show you a little sample, what goes on, some of the information and tips and, and learning opportunities that exist, for some of the best in the world out at Fun and Sun. Come on, you ready to go Fun and Sun? You're, oh okay. I love you too. You wanna go Fun and Sun? You wanna go fishing? Oh man, oh, we gotta go. Too much money. I, yeah, I did the calculations of fuel and lodging and, and entry fees. And you're talking many thousands of dollars. Yeah. So you can go broke quick. Uh, all that happened. I got I got super fortunate. Um, uh, to, to what happened to me is uh, I had a uh, a Crown Royal Crown Royal called me. I remember seeing you in that and Crown Royal. I wasn't. I didn't, I didn't approach them. They called me. Cool. They were looking for an angler. Um, and all this happened. The mega bass call uh, approached me a year before, and then and then and then Crown Rilla calls me, which I thought was a joke. Cause I had friends that joked a lot and called me. I was like, I was a young guy, so we have lots of friends that joke. And I hung up the phone, still thinking it was a joke, because the guy trying to figure out who it was. I can't tell who it was. It sounded like had an accent, southern accent. Trying to figure out which one of your friends it was messing yeah, with I you. Yeah, did. And then he <laughs> called me. He called me like, like, like a little while later, the same day. Yeah. Says, you know, this is. This is for real. I mean, I'm not joking. He thought. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Like, all, right, all right. That's great. I told my wife then. I was like, man, I don't know. And then I just talked about it. And that, that was like, that's the only way I could make it. And, you know, coming from California. And, and it wasn't like a huge sponsorship, but it was pretty big. I mean, it was way bigger than I was, anything I was looking for. It was, you know, a truck, boat, and not, not to keep it, but to use it. And, and enough to pay the entry fee. That was giant. And that that's kind of what it takes to sort of. Um, otherwise, you're gonna have the, you need sponsors unless you have a bunch of money. Um, you're gonna need. There, and, the, and the good thing is, there's a lot of companies out there that there. There's so many companies in the U.S. and there's a company for almost everything they're out there. You just gotta find the right one and, and be able to, you know, show the, you know, show it off enough. And it, it's a lot of work and, and it's sad because I have a lot of guys that are really good and they, they just never got that fortune to get something like that, that kind of break. Yeah. So to tell somebody that's coming up into it, the best thing you can do is just perform. And that's why they called me at first, because like, I was really kind of, I wouldn't say dominating, but sort of dominating the West Coast. And, and they called me, they approached me, which is not going to happen every time. You might have to approach them, but it, it originated from performance. It's like, actually, you're still going to still gonna have to start off like club level if you're young. You know, high school tournaments, now we didn't have that. High school Yeah, college. we didn't. Yeah. So you have all that avenue now, but you still need to perform and work hard at it and try to learn all your different aspects of fishing and become fluent at it. It's not, it's not an easy sport. There's a lot to learn in it, a lot of knowledge to gain. And, uh, and education, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, these days, education, yeah, education, marketing, savvy. Yeah, marketing is super savvy. important. I was never good at that, but I fished really well. So, but it's still going to be off, mainly off performance. They, you may, if you're really good marketing, it might be a, a slot for you and, the, and the, all the other avenues of fishing, but as far as getting that sponsorship on the, like, the leads or going into the opens, you need to, they're looking for guys that perform and right. are also marketable. At the end of the day, you got to catch them better than the next yeah, guy. You still have to catch them. Yeah. 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 Awesome, man. Well, good luck to you guys. Appreciate it. Success as a pro angler simply because how dynamic Lake Fork is and how many different ways you can catch them on Lake Fork. How many big fish you can catch on Lake Fork. Uh, Whatever it is that you want to do, you can really train yourself and hone in on how to specifically target bigger fish on those techniques. Well, and just fish in general, yeah. and catch fish that are hard to catch, because yeah. Lake Fork can be really tough. And then if you figure them out, you start catching them, and you understand what you did, and it helps you become a better angler. Because, you know, it's like fish against the best is how you make yourself better. Lake Fork can be tougher than nails. But even when that's happening,
Jackson, if you can figure out how to catch him, you can catch this like you've never caught him before. And the size is unbelievable. That's what keeps me coming back and everybody else, too. As, you know, that's kind of what I try to tell people is like, obviously, you know, you guys at least Series Creek, that's the holy mecca of you know, competition, bass fishing, all far as the quality of people that fish there. But that group of guys on Lake Forth to go out and fish that lake and try to have to have to put people on them every day, boy, that, that makes you really good. And there's a lot of guys out there that are extremely talented fishermen. Yeah, and, and Lake, lake Forth has also been like guys like Joe Spates. We got the big Joe Spoon. I mean, there has been a lot of baits that have been refined or came out yes. of Lake Forth. Believe it or not, the Cinco started on Lake Forth. Believe it or not, that's where it started. And I can tell you that's a whole different story, but I'll tell you that story. It is the son of the Lake Fork Jackal Ring Fry. How he fished it. The Cinco was supposed to be a Carolina rig bait. Uh, French fry kind of deal. When Gary Yamamoto made it. The Lake Fork Jackal Ring Fry was the same thing. Yes. But since we know what a wacky worm is in Texas, we must have started throwing the ring fry weightless. With the four out hook and big line and catching those big fish, it still works. We throw that wacky rig ring crawl on this channel. Uh, and then the Texas rig too. And then, so a couple of the guys on Lake Fork who were sponsored by Gary Yamamoto, Stan Garzini being the main one, he did that with his Yamamoto baby. So I'll get the other Cinco and do that. And the rest is history. That all started with Lake Fork. A lot of people don't know that, but that's why. Wow. Cinco, I've been around the lake for a pretty long time, but not near as long as guys the like Cinco you. started on Lake Fork, Texas. First time I've heard that story, that's incredible. And that's a whole different story, but that's all because of the ring fry. So it's just crazy. You get that many talented neighbors in one place because we all know our Lake Fork guides are the best guides on the planet. Sorry, Homer, but it's true. It's true. If you're going to Little Bend, that's a great lake too, or Sam Raver, but Lake Fork. Some salty hammers out there. You have to catch fish on that lake every day as tough as it can be. And uh, they're all friends of mine. An incredibly talented group of anglers. This what makes it great if you want to go fishing on Lake Fork. There's such a big pool of extremely talented anglers that can make you a better fisherman just by spending a day in the boat with them and refine techniques or whatever. Because Lake Fork is like going in, in, going in a really, really tough golf course where you got to be on your game to catch them. And that's what makes it so good. It's a great proving grounds. And like I said, there's just something about it. Lake Fork is awesome. I was like, all right. Skips that joker back underneath that willow tree and pop, 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 pop. And then that's, I mean, the lake dumps. Yeah. He sets the hook <laughs> and screams at the top of his lungs, come on, Billy! <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm eating my orange. I have to throw my orange overboard and get the net. I scoop the net up, and, you know, five pounder. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what we needed, brother. That's the one we needed. So I sit back down, and he sits down on the front deck, and I sit down in the chair, and I'm like, what did you scream again? He said, I said, come on, Billy. He said, it's old Yellow Belly, man. Yellow Belly strikes again. That's it. So yeah. when I seen Billy, I figured I had to come tell him that, that Yellow uh, Belly story. That was a, that's a beautiful story, and, and that's the purpose of what, that, that's the that's reason it. I do it right there, guys. That story right there. And so what was that young man's name? Colin Naylor. Colin Naylor, we appreciate you watching the channel. We're so glad. Yellow belly was able to help you finish out your living that tournament because that's the reason I do what I do. So thank you. Hey guys, look who I got. This old Texas legend, Honey Hole Master, Mr. Bill Wilcox. How you doing, sir? Man, good to see you. It's good. To, well, man, you just you've done so much. I, I watched your show for so long. You know, I, I, I got now on Forks. I make a living in the fishing business, but from a long time ago, I've been out fishing on a plastic boat. I used to watch Honey Hole every week. I watched Mr. Bill, and, and you know he was always catching fish. Kind of inspired me in a way because one thing we do on my channel is we share a lot of information more than just about anybody else will. And, and I know your shows are kind of along the same lines, and you were really an inspiration as far as that goes with the amount of information that you share. Well, I appreciate that, and, and that's what you know. The, in the fishing business like this, you know, we're in the business. You know, it's good to give back and to help people catch more fish because that is good for business. Absolutely. That is one of the biggest things that I appreciate is, hey, the more people that catch more fish, the better we all are in the fishing industry. And, and you were kind of like, you're my inspiration for that, so thank you for that. So in case you guys couldn't tell, there's about 5 million fish catchers standing here right now. That is the legend, classic winner Tommy Martin talking to Heath Taylor. And there's Mr. Wilcox right there. Well, we can't really see him, but that's, that's Bill Wilcox's money hole right there. We don't want to interrupt him. Stan, I gotta ask you a question. How many fish catchers are standing in this booth right now? Oh, oh. a few million, <laughs> millions. 
Billions and billions and billions. Now, see, I won't talk unless there's a question. I get Aaron back up here. Where Aaron's at? He slipped off somewhere eating an orange. That's some granola. <laughs> now, he's brave man on that one. No, I was braid 100%. Was, uh, who was? Uh, Casey Ashley. Yeah, Casey Ashley said. Casey Ashley was flipping uh, fluorocarbon in that deal. I've never caught one with ears. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> I do feel like they feel vibration. This is like that deal with the crankbait. Do, do, do. I have been uh, snorkeling before, you know, and tap rocks together. And every summer we would go to Lake Washington and spend two weeks and our, up in the mountains, arcs at gin clear. And uh, fishing was, I thought, was terrible then. And uh, but I could go out there and get two rocks and tap them together. It wouldn't be a second to be three or four bass swim up there. But I, to answer your question, I've heard that. I've even had guys tell me when we go to Florida um, that they thought when they were flipping mats around a group of people that they got more bites flipping fluorocarbon. I ain't never had that. Never had that. Uh -uh. I just, I don't, you know, I, I know what you mean. They hear that, you know, whatever, but I'm like, really? People um, went on their head quick enough. They don't know what happened. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. And I, I catch a lot. You know, a lot of times, you know, cold weather situations where you got to yo-yo it up and down. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, that deal. That I, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I don't know that I would have won at uh, because I, I watch Casey fish. I watched that foot. I, I enjoyed watching that footage. So I watched a couple <laughs> times. Uh, but you know, I noticed like a couple of those big ones that he caught, they were just on big willows, the big clean willows and he's just flipping the base on. I really didn't uh, catch any like that. Like the ones I caught came out, out of the bush. I mean, you know, I mean like right through the middle of it. So I, I'd be afraid of, you know, I, I don't know, like there are situations where I flip with fluorocarbon because I need stretch. Maybe the way they're getting it, because I feel like I can rip the bait out of their mouth. But most of the time, flipping heavy cover with a jig, only time I've ever ha had situations flipping heavy cover and I couldn't stick them with braid just because they weren't getting it good and I had to go to fluorocarbon, it's always with a piece of plastic. I've never run into that situation with a jig. So I'll, I'll be honest with you, in practice for that deal, so I would never get hung, I flipped that uh, slither rig. Strike King slither rig deal, you know, which was the insert, but that thing, I, I, I don't have a lot of luck with it catching them. But it was easy to shake them off. I'd never had to, and I'd never get hung, and i just go and go and go and go and go. So I come back during the tournament, I just flipped a one ounce hack attack jig, and, you know, because I knew I could stick them all. You know, I'd have to be a little gentler, because them bushes, were soft, they were deep, solid limbs, you know, easing that big jig up through there, but I knew when one bit me, now, with that being said, the last day I lose two. I lost a six pounder. I was fixing a swing that completely swallowed it. I must have had skin hooked. He jumped. I hit with camera at a bad angle and I couldn't swing him straight. And I went to swing back and he came off. And I had another five pounder in a dead willow. I jerked him out of the water, you know. But I, that, that's the biggest reason. If I can get by using a jig, I don't use plastics. Cause, but why he was, you know, again, you know how fishermen are, they're head cases. So as long as, you know, I had confidence in Braid and he had, he felt like he needed to be and he did well, you know, but he, he, but again, did that cost him? Because I also watched Swindle's footage in that and it was horrific. I mean, he just hung up, broke off and he was flipping with fluoro and he was having a lot of issues, you know, but I, other than those two, I'd have caught the biggest bag of the event the last day. It didn't matter, but I didn't know that at the time, but, you know, but I just felt like Braid was catching more for me, you know. I mean, maybe I didn't get as many bites as he did, but it, as long as I catch all of them, you know, it doesn't matter. So a lot of times that's what it comes down to. It's not necessarily, it's who's the most efficient. But one thing I wanted to touch on tonight is a big misconception this time of year, uh, especially in this region, East Texas, Northeast Texas, this general region. And it will vary some from lake to lake. Some of the deeper lakes here in Fort Worth area, it, it doesn't happen quite as soon. But especially as you start traveling east and you get over towards LaFon and Hubbard and all these Northeast Texas lakes and the deep East Texas lakes, this is a really big misconception. People think in January you need to be fishing a little bit deeper water, mid-depth or deeper water. It's just not the case. Uh, if you think about it like this, every year on these flatter, shallower lakes like Lake Fork and other lakes around here, uh, fish will start spawning around Valentine's Day. Every year, it happens. We always see the first few stragglers, the first little small wave coming in Valentine's Day. 
if that is when they start spawning, then that means we are in full go in the middle of the pre-spawn as soon as January hits. Because the pre-spawn situation takes time to develop and time to process. Um, so, don't think that you need to be fishing. You can catch really big fish in the dirt right now, like in this much water, especially like this week, uh, we had a really warm night, an extremely warm night, and that's how you know when it's really time to get back there real far. It's not, everybody sees, well, it was 75 today, and they're like, well, the water's gonna warm up. No, because it was 35 at night, so the water temps just kind of do an up and down evolution. They don't ever climb and keep climbing. Even if you have a 70 degree day, if you have a 65 degree night and the water temp is in the lower 50s, well that water's going to climb during the day, it's going to maintain or slightly climb at night, and then the next day it's going to climb even more. So now you, instead of doing this, you've really made some ground up in your water temperature. And that is really going to key the bait first to push back, and the bass that are in pre-spawn mode are trying to eat as much food as they can. Anybody ever had a pregnant wife? Yep. You ever watched her eat? Yep. They finna get after it, Jack, and so are all these female bass right now. They getting after it on the eating. So, uh, I just wanted to talk tonight about this real brief because we don't have a whole lot of time left. But you can fish extremely shallow in January and February and catch really big fish. Some of the biggest bags you'll ever catch in your life. Uh, our day after that warm night, the other night, we had an unbelievable day. Uh, best day I've had in quite some time, really. Uh, we fished for six hours that day and we caught 50 something fish. And we had, I can't tell how many we had over four or five pounds, just a bunch, a bunch. Uh, we didn't catch any sure enough freak nine, ten pounders, but we caught a lot of really fun fish to catch. And so anytime you do something like that, it was an unbelievable day. You wouldn't think that you would go back there in January and catch 50 plus fish in six hours and, and catch them on moving baits, like chatter baits, swim baits, you know, stuff like that. And that's how we were catching them. So tons of fun to be had. There's a lot of people that miss that bite. I see a lot of people that don't ever get far enough back this time of year. Uh, like I said, any questions anytime, let me know. So I'm going to go into just a couple baits, and we'll try to keep it on time here for Mr. Monty. Also, want to take time to thank Fun and Son for allowing me to do this. I've watched people, some of my heroes in sport on this stage, so for me to be standing on this stage is pretty cool. It's a pretty cool deal for me. Yes, sir. I want to know where you got your shoes. <laughs> these are, these are uh, if you look at them real close, of course, we got red, white, and blue, these colors on run. And then there's some warfighters down there on, on the shoes. And I actually ordered these, a Facebook ad got me. But these are the terrorist stompers. So if there's any terrorists in the building, come get kicked in the face. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, so um, baits that you can use. Uh, even though I'm talking about fish getting shallow and getting active, I will say the water temps are still cold. The water temps we were fishing the other day on that warming trend that we really caught them was anywhere between 56 to 59 degrees. And in the afternoon, we did see some 60, 61. But we did most of our damage. We started off catching real good in the morning in 56, 57, 58 degree water. So that's still cold water. Like it's not just 70 degree water where the fish are just like chewing everything you throw at them. That being said, I still do like to go with baits that will cause a fish to react. When a fish is not wanting to bite, so when water tips are colder and the fish is not necessarily just super active wanting to bite, there's two ways to catch them. You can go finesse or you can go reaction. I live in East Texas and I stay East and further East from Fort a lot. I fish a lot of shallow water fisheries with a lot of heavy cover, uh, a little bit more stained water than you'll get, say, a Ray Roberts or something over here. So I choose to go more of the reaction, you know, plus I'm just, that's how I like to fish. I would much rather power fish than slow down. That, that's my deal. So what you can do is go reaction, and the best bait, maybe the best bait to me, two of them that I'll talk about. First one is a chatterbait. Everybody, if you don't know about the chatterbait over the last eight, nine, ten years, like you've been kind of sleeping a little bit, because chatterbait is unbelievable in the vibration and the way it causes fish to react. But another one that's really good that I think gets looked over in the cold time of year because it has such an aggressive action is a crankbait called a Movement ADX from Six Sense Fishing. And it has the widest wobble of any shallow diving crankbait you'll find on the market. And I think people see that and think, okay, we need to fish that hard wobbling bait later in the year when fish are more aggressive. Not the case. That hard wobbling bait will make a sluggish fish react better than a regular square bill that has a tighter wiggle, in my opinion. And the big deal about the 6 inch women ADX, if you go, they got some over there in the tackle store. If you look at it, the bill is wider than the nose. If that, does that make sense? Okay. So when that head is shaking, that bill is sticking out way further than the head of the bait is. So as you come up to a stump, that bill is swinging so hard it hits that stump, it bounces off harder 
there's more violent deflecting qualities than any other crankbait I've ever thrown. And so I try to, if I, especially if I'm around a lot of wood or brush or some type of hard cover rock, if you guys are fishing Hubbard or some Ray Roberts rock, right? Uh, this bait is phenomenal in the winter time. As long as the fish are pushing shallow like they do when you get a warmer trend, this bait's unbelievable because it bounces so hard and causes such a, has such a big deflection, it just causes these big, violent reactions from these bigger, dominant bass. So, any questions? We got eight minutes. Yes, sir. Okay. Again, we're going to go misconception a little bit, okay? Because there is a little bit of misconception in that. And Miss Craig, for those who couldn't hear, asked what color is the best in the stained water? Because in the wintertime, we do, the water tends to be dirtier than it is the rest of the year. Especially like lately, we've been getting lots of rain. So a lot of our water needs back to these creeks. It's going to be like so dirty, you might look at it and go, uh, eh, maybe we shouldn't fish it. That's another misconception, like fishing. That dirty water this time of year is a good thing, especially on a warming trend. That dirt content in the water actually helps that water warm faster. The dirtier the water, the faster it's going to warm, especially the calm, dirty water. The stuff you normally go in January, I'm getting away from cold, uh, I'm getting away from dirty, calm water in January. Well, if you're on a warming trend, you need to go too. It warms faster than everything else. The color now, this is something that, uh, that I've talked about with a couple of guide buddies of mine over the year and, and kind of a synopsis or theory that I've come to uh, and, and so some of them. You know, we like to throw chartreuses and reds and stuff like that in dirty water. And I'm not saying that that won't work. Like, we certainly catch our fair share of fish on, on, a, on a red or orange crawfish colored shallow diving crank bait. That does happen. But one thing that I thought about was if you look at a shad or you look at a bass, think, think about a bass that lives in muddy, muddy, muddy water. What color is that bass? It's dark. They start turning whitish, they get pale. Well, the shad get even more pale as well. So my number one color in dirty water in the pre-spawn is white. White shad bait. I'm not talking about like a little gray shad. I'm talking about white, white. And even on the crankbait, on the shad patterns, I'm not going to a gray or a silver or a blue back. I'm looking for the whitest crankbait that I can find. The brightest white I can find. Because all those bait fish get extremely pale in that cold, dirty water. And that, it's worked well for me, so. You like that? <laughs> Good deal. Hey, I do want to, I give a shout out. I've got a, uh, you know, I know we were talking about swim baits a minute ago in Lake Fork. And the biggest swim bait catch over the last few years is sitting in the house, and it's this, the youngest guy in the crowd. He's right here. He caught a 12 pound, two ounce bass with me two years ago on a big swim bait out of Fork. So that's stuff James was talking about. It's real, it works. That's one little buddy, bro. He's a really good young man, so. All right, what else? That guy, right there. That guy that, the short one, <laughs> with the floppy hair. It's like my kids got floppy hair. Yes, sir? Uh, what would be areas that you'd be targeting right now? Great question, and that is something I wanted to cover tonight, and we've just got a few minutes left, and I'm going to try and cover it as good as I can for you, because that's an in-depth question. He asked, what areas are we looking for? So I'm going to try to make this general and give you guys the fast, shortcut version of this. Um, you want to find the flattest ground. The deal is, if you have less volume of water, it's going to be able to warm a lot quicker. So if you have a creek that's kind of narrow and has steep banks and it carries the depth further back in the creek, that's going to be more total volume of water. So it's going to take longer. The deeper the water, longer it's going to take for it to warm up. The big, broad bay type of creeks, the big, flat, expansive, wide type of coves, uh, that is going to be a bigger expanse of shallow water that's like this deep. And the more of this that you have, like acres and acres and acres, the faster it will warm up. The other key is if it is in the northwest corner. So like, who knows, who's been to Lake Fork? So most of you guys have been to Lake Fork. Great. So one of the, the codes that everybody knows is, you know, no secret, Glade gets good early. Glade Bay gets really good early. When you think about the way Glade sets up, it's this humongous, big broad flat that has a bunch of water this deep. I mean a bunch of water this deep to this deep. And it's the mouth of it's in the southeast corner and the back of it's in the northwest corner. This is the ideal, ideal situation of what I'm talking about. Big broad flat water, a whole lot of water that's one to two foot deep, and the sun, because the sun in the wintertime is further south. So in the early morning that sun's gonna hit that northwest corner first. Because the sun's further south of us than it normally is. As we go throughout the year, the sun gets closer to us. Okay? So that northwest corner is going to get that sun the longest. It's going to hit it first. It's going to start warming the quickest. So when you can line everything up, 
and you can get flat, shallow water, a little bit of stain, a little bit of flow, a little bit of dirt content in the water, nice and calm and protected from these cold fronts like the northwest corner is, and then you get that sun angle on it, and you line all those things up, and then if you add a little bit of grass in there, I mean, you're, you're set up for, this is exactly what we're talking about. Yep, yep, yep. So, are you chasing shallower water versus water temp, or are you chasing bait this, this time of year? I'm more shallower yeah, water yeah, and it. temperature versus right. Bait. I get it. It's a tricky question because you're gonna they're gonna correlate. Right. They're gonna correlate. So the more that the water tip warms up, the more the bait fish are gonna get in there, the more the bass are gonna get in there. But yeah, to me, I'm paying more attention to areas that they're gonna spawn early. So gotcha. these areas that will warm up quicker. Yeah. And and I'm paying more attention to the water tips in those areas than I am the bait fish. But what happens is when you find those areas that they're going to spawn early, you find those areas that are warming up quicker, the bait fish are going to be, they, they end up being there anyway, generally. But I'm not necessarily going, well, this area has more bait fish than this area, because the closer we get to spawn, for these early spawning fish, and these fish, when they're spawning, bait is kind of irrelevant right. in a lot of ways, okay. once they get on the bed. So as we get closer and closer to spawn, the less and less I'm so concerned with bait. Now, there is other fish, you know, the, <laughs> There's other fish that are further behind that won't spawn until April and May that they're still on the main lake. And sure. bait is all that matters for them this time of year. It's the only thing that matters. That's one bait deal. The only thing that matters is the bait fish. Um, they can be on all different types of areas. They can be on points, creek bins, everything. It's, but the bait fish is what those fish are on that bait that are on the main lake in the winter. So different, two different fish. There always is. There's all this year round. There's shallow water fish year round. There's deep water fish on all these fisheries in Texas. We're so lucky to have all these fertile, full fisheries. They're just full of fish, and, and there's always options. I like shallow water fish, and I grew up in Southeast Texas where all we had was shallow muddy water, so it's where I'm comfortable. And I've kind of learned a couple of these tricks that maybe get looked over through having like if you fish a, a fishery that has nothing but shallow dirty water. Well, in the wintertime, guess what you're fishing? Shallow, dirty water, and you kind of learn some things, and then you go to lakes that have options, you go, yeah, but I caught them in something that looked like this, and then you end up back there, and that's kind of how I stumbled on this deal at Lake Fort myself. I was just fishing what I knew from fishing dirty water, shallow fisheries growing up, so. Um, you ever consider it's blown out where it's too muddy? It gets to a point, so here's, here's the key on that. I don't consider it too dirty as far as the water color. I don't never, I, I, it's pretty extreme for me to get to that point, but what I don't like is like the day after a really hard, just flowing rain, if there's debris all over the surface, I'm, I'm out. You know what I'm saying? Like as long as, it can be dirty stained water, but as long as there's not, you know, grasses and leaves and stuff from the bank and trash floating, I don't want that. To me, that's not a stable environment. Fish bite better in a stable environment. Whether it's cold water, hot water, or in between water, if it's been stable, the fish bite better. They get set up, they get more, I don't know if they bite better, but it's, able, it's easier for you to get consistently to target them and pattern them if they've been doing the same thing for several weeks. I went to Guadalupe Monday and I thought it was blown out because it was just yeah, so thick. Yeah, that's, that's an area that can get blown out because it can, washes a lot of debris in from Guadalupe, another area on Lake Fork that's way up the big east arm. Uh, it can definitely get blown out. A lot of flow comes through there. Glade, the back corner of Glade can get blown out. The thing about Glade that's cool is even when part of it get blown out, gets blown out, it's such a big, broad area. There's something in there that's clean. There's always a part of it that's clean. You can always kind of hunt it down if you look for it hard enough. So Glade's a unique deal, but yeah, Ola Bay can get blown out at times. And I imagine after that rain we had the other day, it probably was. Working the creek channel back into Glade, working that area, trying to catch these fish that are pre-spawning? So I'm kind of going to the back now. We've gotten to the time of year where I'm going straight to the back. Now I'm working the channel edges within the backs. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So wherever those channel edges are within that big grass line in the back creek, I am, especially like on today, uh, that's the other thing. Once these fish push back there on that one trend, they're not leaving. So when you get a day like today, the last couple of days have been getting cold again, they'll suck back into those drains and creek channel edges and just kind of hunker down in there and they get harder to catch. But if you've been catching them on that flat back there and then they pull back, you just have to stay after it, fish real methodical, real slow, use those reaction baits, bang those stumps around that creek channel as many times as you can and get a reaction bite. And then once you get a couple of them to bite, you can usually catch a group of them in an area on those cold days. So think about this, another good tip for this deal, warming trend, you might catch them one or two at a time. They'll spread out and get up on the flat. Cold trend, when you get a bite, hunker down and go slow. Because once you get a bite, there's there's more than one. If it's on a cold trend and those fish have been spread out, they suck back, there's always more than one. Always. Yeah, it was 54 degrees yesterday. Yeah. 
And the deal was the temperature is not nearly as important as the trend. That's the other big thing. So like 54 degree water is pretty good this time of year, but if it was 58 yesterday, it's going, you're going to have to grind on them. And then once you get them, they'll be in a group, but you got to grind on them. Whereas if it was 54 today and it's 58 tomorrow, boy, they're going to get up spread out and get after it. Does that make sense? All right, I think I have reached my time limit. It is time for everybody to go home. I went two minutes long. Thank you guys so much for listening to me. I love fishing, and I love all of you for listening to me talk about us. Thank you. Amen. Hey, folks at home, this is Mr. Emmett. Do you watch your Lake Fort guys? You do? Do you like the bass fish? What's your favorite bait? Um, a jerk bait, maybe. <laughs> hey, buddy, we appreciate you. You know that? Thank you for watching. You're awesome. Give me some knuckles. All right. <laughs> Blowing it up. Well, guys, I'm here with Mr. Monty from Fun and Some Boats out here in Hearst. Hearst, Texas, yes. Hearst, Texas. It's somewhere between Dallas and Fort Worth. I know yeah, that. Right. Closer to Fort Worth. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a deal they do every year out here in kind of late January, mid to late January every year. Is that right? Yes. It's in January sometime. We, sometime. we bounce around depending gotcha. on what's going okay. on in the marketplace. Well, it's a great time of year because it seems like every year we come here, the weather's cold, rain is it's usually a little nasty day. Today's beautiful. Yesterday was kind of nasty, but we always have the bad weather, and it's like good boat show weather. Yes. You know what I mean? Nobody wants to be that uncomfortable, so we come inside and hang out. That's right. That's right. We can't, it's all been good. can't be fishing. We'll come here and talk about fishing. And you guys bring some of the biggest names in the business here every year. You got, in my opinion, the two very best boat brands, Skeeter and Phoenix, in the house. Uh, and y'all just do an amazing job. How long have y'all been doing this, this boat show? This is our 10th year. Uh, we started this, you know, like I say, 10 years ago, yeah. and uh, it's grown every year. We've uh, we started out with about 15 vendors and went to 20 and 25. And, yeah. and this year we've sold over 70 spaces. So it's full. It's full. I mean, I don't know how we get any more in yeah. here. Yeah, y'all gonna have to blow the walls out or something. <laughs> I know it. Yeah, we're gonna have to. But uh, it's it's all been good, and everybody kind of works with us. And even though the spaces kind of get mixed and scooted around, and everybody just goes with the flow, and we try to do the best we can to get everybody the ample space. And there's so many different vendors this year. There's, we've got so many different products yeah. that you don't see on the shelf. And so it's been been very cool for everybody. It's always really cool. It's something I look forward to every year. I get to see people I only see once a year sometimes from right. all over the state of Texas inside the industry. And like we said, some of the biggest things, like Brandon Polnick is right behind us right now. Yep. Aaron Martin's just walked past us. Like, right. these are legends of the sport. Absolutely. You come and hang out. And it's a really cool opportunity for fans of the sport to get down here to Fun and Sun. A, you're going to get to see some tackle you wouldn't see anywhere else. B, you're going to get to hear a lot of knowledge get passed from some of the greatest minds in the business. And you can have the opportunity, like right now, there's a young man talking to Brandon Polnick behind this camera at this moment as we speak and you can walk up to these guys who you look up to who you're a fan of meet them talk to them pick their brain ask them questions and it's so cool because the one thing is i found over the years all these guys are just they just love fishing too and they'll talk to you about all of it it's a really neat opportunity and we i really appreciate you putting this together every y'all putting this together because it provides a, a unique opportunity for you know listen i make my living in the business but before of all of that i just love to catch another fish like i just want to catch the next fish absolutely and i never stop thinking about it and then you put a whole bunch of people in the building that are of the like mind. It's such a cool experience being here, just meeting random people and meeting the big names and all that. So. Yeah, these guys, all the pros are very good about sharing yeah. knowledge. I mean, they'll tell you, we had Aaron Marks here, you know, he's been here every year uh, for the last two or three years, but the first year he was here, he sat down for over an hour and showed guys how to tie knots. Yeah. I mean, I mean, who does that? You know, who's right. going to take the time to do that? These guys all will do that. They're they so it. good. They love it. They're obsessed with it. They're very appreciative of the people that want to take the time to talk to them. Absolutely. Um, and uh, it's just an awesome deal. So, man, uh, is there anything else you want to get out to the viewers about information on this event? Man, I tell you, you know, if there's anybody out there that's making uh, your own bait or have a small company, this is kind of the platform we use to help people grow into uh, – something that you'll see on the shelves in the future. Some of these guys are making these spinner baits and jigs out of their garage and, and those are the kind of people we're looking for to help them see if we can't get their name out there, get the product, a little exposure, and uh, come get a, a spot from us next year. We'll scoot a little more and we'll find yeah. a way to get everybody in here. But, we'll squeeze but yeah, and come down and enjoy the show. It's a family deal. We want everybody to come out, bring the kids and, and just have fun. Yeah, and one thing for sure, if you're looking for a brand new bass boat, there ain't no better place in DFW to come find it than right here. You got the two best brands in the same house. We're sitting here leaning up against one of these fine FXRs that just came out. Mm -hmm. These suckers are bad to the bone. Yep. Phoenix is real good in their own right. Yep. And uh, I know this, you guys, between you and Fane and everybody up here, y'all do a great job taking care of people. So y'all, come see my boy Monty up here at Funnison. Monty, thank you, sir.